record. We'll have that record all the way through. Perfect. Yep, it says I'm recording. So, hello and welcome to our second um, uh, webinar of the year. Of the year. <laughs> um, and today we're going to continue our thoughts about uh, split plot designs. I'm going to save this while I've got a minute. And we're actually going to extend our thinking about split plot designs to repeated measures. So we're going to review um, a split plot design. We have a whole plot factor uh, that's randomized as RCB. And that's going to be, we usually refer to that as factor A. And then within that, we independently randomize a second factor or a second type of treatment um, and call that factor B. And they are randomized within the whole plot. So it's a restricted randomization. Okay? Um, but it's also a repeated measure type analysis or a repeated measurement type of experiment because the assessments on the subplots are repeated measurements of a single experimental unit. And that's why I wanted to reinforce the idea that on split plot designs, the whole plot is a single experimental unit. Even though we take multiple measurements within it because we have applied different treatments, it's still that single experimental unit. So when we talk about repeated measures analysis, we uh, are actually covering three different types of analysis. One is split plot. The other is typically longitudinal as the way it's referred to. And then there is a multivariate repeated measures analysis. Okay, so split plot. And again, I'm going to repeat myself. The subplot effects are independently randomized. And we consider that the assessments are made approximately simultaneously. If you're out in the field collecting data and you're, you're measuring plots, you're not getting them at exactly the same time. But for the purposes of our analysis, we don't consider time to be a factor. It may take you a couple hours to go from one end of the field to the other. It may take you half a day, but we still consider that all being measured at the same time. When we get to longitudinal, the measures are on the same experimental unit, but they are separated in time. Okay that there is, there is a distinct uh, gap. Somehow we identify this. Um, and if for ARM's purposes, it's usually measurements taken on the order of days or weeks or months. Um, the problem with that as a split tie, uh, what makes it different from split plot designs is you cannot independently randomize time. Okay? If you take a measurement, your, your factor, for the subplot levels in a repeated measures analysis, the way we, we refer to repeated measures in ARM, your subplot factor is a date. And you cannot independently randomize dates. You're always going to have dates in a sequential order. And this is going to be the key thing that, that we're going to look at when we get to the analysis of repeated measures in ARM, is how do we deal with the fact that we cannot independently randomize time. Now, multivariate, I'm only going to touch on, maybe I'll, I'll get to it, is that we have measures from the same experimental unit, but on different rating scales. And we, if we want some way to combine them, um, there are multivariate analysis. We don't directly support it in ARM, but we can fudge it. And um, we get to that, uh, as I said, I'll, I'll try to leave some time to come back to this topic, but it's not really the key topic for today. So let's move on. And I got, I have to cover some math. Unfortunately, to really get to the point that I want to get to for this discussion, uh, we want to talk about um, the structure of error. And I, I got to, I'll, I'll point out, I, I borrowed some of Matt's slides and he has in, used a lot of these different graphics and icons. And I didn't really think about what, which ones, I just left them in there because they were nice decorations. So I don't know if this, uh, whatever this magnifying glass is, is relevant um, versus this notepad, but uh, I just like to have little things in there. So we'll go back to the repeated measures and the comparison between repeated measures and factorial designs. When we move from the factorial model, and I'll, I'll uh, uh, briefly 
you know, we have a mean effect, we have a factor A, we have a factor B, we have an interaction between the two factors, we have a replicate term, and then we have our residual error. In the split plot model, we have our same mean, we have our factor A, factor B, but again, repeating factor B is time. Uh, we have our replicate effect. We have our interaction between our assessment and time. Uh, our, our, our interaction between our specific treatment and time. And then we have this whole plot error term, which I'm denoting D for this exercise. And then we have our residual error term. That's a hierarchical hair structure because we have constraints on these variables. We say that the residual error is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation that we identify usually as our error mean square. Our split plot model has two constraints. One is that we have our residual error and the other is we have a standard deviation associated with our whole plots. That would be the RCB error of the whole plot design. So again, trying to reemphasize what I tried to cover last week is we have two different error terms. Now, the next step we need to kind of make to really appreciate um, how the, the errors fall out and what we want to look for in the error terms is we can take a, I should write this, this is actually a linear effects model. I'm just going to go ahead linear effects, linear model. Just restate what that is. We, we can restate this mathematical formula in matrix terms where Y is a vector, just a list of numbers, and our error is a vector. And then we have a matrix X that identifies our experimental design. This has a one or a zero in the play in columns. Column one, we represent a mean. Column two is going to represent a alpha sub one. Column three is alpha sub two, et cetera, et cetera, through the various um, parameters that we have in our model. And our beta vector then is going to be our solutions to these different parameters we have in the model. And then we have a single, our, our single constraint that the E's are normally distributed with a single standard deviation term. Okay. Now, the reason we want to think about the linear model is because when we get to split plot and similar designs, we tend to use a mixed effects model. And we state the mixed effects model in what's most commonly the layered ward uh, nomenclature, where the fixed effect parts of the model, in this case, are going to be our treatment effects, um, our A's and B's are going to be part of I left that wrong. That shouldn't quite be in there. But it doesn't really make that much difference what I'm trying to get through today. We leave that in this portion of the model, but we also define a random component where we have random effect indicators. And for our purposes, we're going to look at the indicators for the whole plot or treatment by trial or the treatment by replicate interaction uh, effects. The reason we do this is we can state two different matrices that give us the um, error, the distribution of the error for our whole plot effects and a different distribution for our error for the residual effects. But that gives us a way to state the covariance of our uh, observations of Y. And we state this mathematically as our indicator variables for the random effects times the uh, error structure for the random effects. Z transpose Z gives us is uh, symmetric matrix, and we add in the R effects. That probably, I don't know if that makes much sense right now, and it doesn't need to, because we're going to go to some uh, uh, something hopefully a little better. So if we talk about the covariance of Y, and this is the, the, the covariance of Y is the degree to which our observations are related to each other. So this is what we're really trying to focus on now is if we take a measurement um, and we're actually looking at the means here, where the means of y sub one, one. Um, so in this case, it would be our whole plot treatment and our subplot treatment. So whole plot A, factor A, factor B, the degree to which those means are correlated 
is zero if they're not the same treatment. Okay. This is what we tend to assume. Can I go back to this one? With this model, when we have something like this, we say that all of these other things that we're measuring in our experiment are not correlated with each other. And that's why we end up with only this single sigma in our statement about residual error. And we have a single error mean square that we use for all our uh, mean comparisons. So this is what we tend to assume when we work with a uh, simple non-hierarchical or non-stratified error structure. There is no expected correlation uh, among our observations, among our means. We talk about IID errors. When we have a split plot covariance, and in this case, I'm using a one to be the whole plot factor, and then the second digit is the subplot factor. So whole plot treatment A, um, subplot treatment A1, or whole plot, let me rephrase that. Whole plot treatment A1, subplot treatment B1, whole plot treatment A1, subplot treatment, treat, 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 treatment B2, whole plot A1, subplot B3. They all share a common um, error for the main for the the means themselves the error of the the means that yeah the error of the mean is given by this term which includes an estimate of the residual error plus a degree of error associated with the whole plot then the treatments that share whole plots so treatment one two is whole plot level a subplot level b2 shares the whole plot factor with treatment 1-1 and treatment 1-3. Because they share that whole plot factor, they have a common variance term. Now, if we look at the combination of whole plot factor 2, whole plot 2, and factor B1, they don't ever share the same whole plot. Okay, that particular combination of treatments are never together in the same whole plot, so they have a covariance of zero. Okay. So things that are measured on the same experimental unit have a correlated error. Things that are not measured on the same experimental unit have uncorrelated errors. Now this is what uh, we, we talked about last week when we talked about split plot designs, but I simplified it because I talked about when we look at the whole means, uh, say treatment A1 versus treatment A2, we use the whole plot residual error, get our, our error term, and we looked at the subplot errors. So if B, uh, factor B1 versus factor B2, we use the residual error term. When we try to do cross correlations, we have this adjusted error term, because when we're doing cross correlations, we're comparing a treatment mean here, say this Y22 with a treatment here, Y13. If we compare 1, 1 and 1, 2, these terms cancel each other out and we can ignore them and we can only, we only need to worry about that single, um, single uh, residual error term. Here, this one doesn't have that combination, so we can't ignore that variable and we ended up having to factor back in and there's some math arithmetic that goes in here. So what we talked about last time with the uh, error terms for split plot at the whole plot level versus the subplot level have in them these calculations of these two standard deviations and the standard deviations appear in this covariance matrix. Okay, I hope I haven't lost you too much on that because this is what we need to worry about when we have uh, repeated assessments that are not independently randomized. This assumes that the various assessments we make are independently randomized within this, but not within here. So they are independent of each other. This one, we do not have independence in the case of assessments that are made sequentially. And by this, I mean, when we look at whole plot A1, 
we make a measurement at time one, we make a measurement at time two, we make a measurement at time three. We go to a different plot, we make a measurement at time one, then we make a measurement at time two, then we make a measurement at time three. Any error we had in our first measurement is probably going to carry over to our second measurement. It might not be an error in measurement per se, it might be an error in application of treatment. If there's an error in the application of treatment, that error is going to carry over. So when we look at a covariant structure for a repeated measures design, we include a correlation term. And so I have rho as the correlation coefficient. So measurement number two is correlated with measurement number one by a certain amount, and we multiply that in. Well, measurement three is going to be correlated with measurement two by a correlation coefficient. And since measurement two is correlated to measurement one, we actually square that correlation, fission, that correlation coefficient when we get to measure three. Again, we have uncorrelated errors when they are not within the same subplot units. But when they are, we have to account for a degree of correlation. So let's try to make that a little more concrete. And we go back to uh, the experiment I talked about last time, where I am having a whole plot where I try to apply a treatment of burning, mowing, or spraying. And then within that, apply seeding. And by the way, I don't think I mentioned, but these flags are the boundaries of my subplots. So the mow strip are my whole plot boundaries and the flags are my subplot boundaries. And so we have three preparation methods that are applied to the whole plot, burning, mowing, and spraying. And then within the subplots, I have three seeding mixes. And so this is the, this is the image that I showed uh, in the middle of the summer, what a, the split plot portion of this experiment looked like. Now I'm going to segue to a repeated measures of this. We're going to lose the split plot analysis. Um, because right now, the way we have the analysis, it's an extra layer of calculation to do the split plot and split plot and get the error terms right. So right now, we're just going to look at the RCB design of this experiment, that is treatment one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are going to be our three treatments. And then we're going to sit it, consider the repeated measures of those treatments. So to illustrate this, Come on, don't hang up on me. My computer's, oh, there we go. So what we're going to look at is a, a data I generated from a sequence of photographs of the subplots. So plot 211, or plot 112 is my first one. And this was one of the burn plots. And you can see that it is a little brown, a little blackened on May 21st. That was about three weeks after application. June, I started to see getting green. August, I tried a different camera. Um, so I've got a, gonna have a little bit of a measurement error there. September 4th, I took another picture, September 24th and October 3rd. So you can see there's a progression um, in this particular plot that had the burn treatment. And here's a uh, spray treatment where I sprayed Roundup on the first week of May. And you can see uh, that there is an indeed an effect due to that whole plot effect. And later in the season, we see the um, different plants germinate. So let's go ahead and do the repeated measures analysis in ARM. And so that's where we have um, these data columns. And so you have this, uh, I think Matt sent you out these files or made these available. We don't have the images in there, but we're gonna be looking at where I converted uh, the images to RGB. And I have, there's just the percent red, the percent green and the percent blue. And I like red for this one, for this example. So we're gonna print reports and selecting a repeated measures analysis. And I think we're gonna leave that for now. And so the quickest way is to, I've already done this. I can click on different fields. Um, if I click on a field, it tries to match. Now this one I've matched red, green, and blue because they're just rated on color and percent. 
that's going to be more columns than I want to include in this analysis. So I'm just going to type in red in my description and that will give me a subset of my images. So we're good there. I'm going to go ahead and select next. And we get some options and I'm going to leave that as the date. That's all I really need to describe these differently. And I said, I mentioned that this is a split plot design that we don't quite have uh, support for for repeated measures. So this is going to be just analyzed as an RCB. And we'll go ahead and preview it. And we should note that this table, the, the R report format is going to look very much like the split plot design, uh, the, the split plot reports, because we did indeed um, borrow our, our previous design and use the same report structure as split plot. So here our whole plot effects are our treatment combinations. The burning, burn, burn and none, burn in Iowa, burn in Minnesota, mow, uh, mow in the different seedings and spray in the different seedings. And we see that the effects are what I would expect for this assessment in that the spray across all measurements um, over this interval, the spray tends to be different than the burn uh, plots. And the mole actually is, for this particular measurement, tends to be different. It shares a little bit of overlap with the burn. Okay. And we do see that these uh, assessments are almost all unique, or they're very different across time. Well, let's go to the graph and take a look at that. So this is what we're seeing with the main effects. Across the board, average across the board, which basically is the average across each of these curves, we have um, burning uh, is very different right off at the start because it's blackened and it loses a lot of color uh, on, this, on the first day of measurement, whereas mowed and sprayed don't look very different because they're still largely residual. Um, on the second day, we see that the three uh, sprayed treatments all become quite a bit different colored. Uh, that browning is actually that's where we're picking up extra red because we lost the chlorophyll. And in the mo, uh, we only see some minor changes over time. Um, by the middle uh, of the summer, by August, they've all picked up about the same amount of red. And we see a decline over time where the um, as we go into false senescence so we can go back and look at that our um, main our whole plot effects where we have our highest amount of red is in august and september and it's kind of um, symmetrically different um, on either side of those dates so we kind of look here and see the decline and the increase um, so that's the key part. It's really difficult when we get to this to try to make interpretations on the interaction effects. Uh, and I haven't found a nice way to move these into the graphs. We don't have the tool yet in ARM to do slicing. And that's one of the ways that we can do this is we look at the pairwise comparisons within each date. Um, and we're kind of uh, looking for ways to make that clean and user friendly in order to specify it. Okay. So let's see, what did I want to get to next with this one? Let me see if I cover the main points. Yeah, okay. Now, one of the things we want to consider, and let's go back a step, is I talk about correlation and degrees of freedom. So that's what I have in my, my title here is the air degrees of freedom. So one thing we want to think about is if we look at these, these three plots here on the bottom, okay, May 21st, June 11th, July 13th for this sprayed plot. I have three photos. Okay. 
but really, do I have three different measurements? And, and this, this is the key, uh, the key thing to think about because I really don't learn much new information about this treatment with these three photos. I mean, those patches of green, um, those are errors. That's an error that I made when I applied the spray to this particular plot, I missed a gap. That error stays here. I don't learn anything new about that treatment with this other than I just, well, I get the same error. Here, I get a little bit of a change. And we see that to some extent in these measurements. Across the board with these same, these same um, each of these is five plots. And these are all subplots in the same whole plot treatment. So the type of errors I made that I can detect this day are gonna be the same type of errors that carry through on this day. There's a little bit of change by this day. But among these, I have five assessments for that uh, combination of uh, whole plot treatment and seeding, five assessments for that, five assessments for that. So I have 15 assessments here that I have another uh, within, within that whole plot, or I can look at it as I have five assessments here, five assessments here, five assessments here. That's 15 assessments. But are they 15 independent assessments? Are they really new information? Are they unique? Are they uh, independent of each other? And that's the question we ask in the next part. With this correlation structure, if these are correlated, they're not independent measurements, which means they're not each one a whole and complete single degree of freedom in our assessments. So one of the things we need to be concerned with is the idea of sphericity. And I'm not going to go too much detail on it other than to point out that under our assumption of split plot design with independent randomization, we can assume sphericity holds. And sphericity is simply a way of saying that the errors are homogenous. That if I look at the treatment mean one one versus one two, that has an error term that is the same error term if I look at one one versus one three, All right? And if I look at one two versus one three, those error terms are homogenous, independent of which pairs I am comparing. If we have correlated errors, then the error term that I want to use when I look at treatment one one versus one two is going to be a different value than the error term I use when I look at one one versus one three. Okay, so our test of sphericity is a way of testing whether our repeated measurements are all for effective purposes independent from each other and it can be analyzed as a split plot. If they are correlated and they have this um, lack of homogeneity in the error terms, then what we do to correct for it in the current analysis is to reduce error degrees of freedom. And there's some math in here. And I, oh, I did do, I did find something that I can look at. So let's go back to our plots. And in this ARM report, we have down here a covariance table. So this is May 12th, the, the measurements on May 12th, May 21st, June 11th, June 13th, da, da, da. and I'm focusing on this upper corner because it's easiest. So the measurements made in October, um, we have a residual covariance, which is the raw calculation of error. And the covariance we would get, uh, the estimated covariance we would get if we could assume that this was a split plot design. So this is a measurement of the covariance if it were split plot. This is the actual covariance among these different measurements. And so we also include correlation if they if if it's um, split plot, then obviously October first with its October eighth with itself, which is uh, column number sixty, is going to be one hundred percent correlated. Okay. If it's uh, um, not uh, uncorrelated, or there's not residual variance, then we have to look to see if the 
uh, covariant structure is uh, homogeneous. Sorry, I gotta take a drink of water. So on the assumption of uh, sphericity, the covariance would we have for September 24th and October 8th is going to be about 0.27. What we measured is about a 0.48. That gives us a correlation coefficient of about 0.14. And we are get another correlation coefficient of about 0.14. Um, we have a slightly larger covariance uh, than we would expect given split plot design for September 4th and October 8th. And September 24th, we have about a 0.4% correlation. So that's what I'm highlighting in this slide here. So we're taking this correlation table, and this again, this is adapted from ARM correlation report, except we keep the correlations on the main axis. And we are asking, does the correlation structure look more like this, the split plot design, or more like the autocorrelated design? And then there's a number that's calculated from these values and it's called E. And if it's one, then it indicates that this is the, uh, the data are close to this model or exactly to that model. And we don't need to worry about the correlation among our repeated measures. So if we look at our outputs, we have different formulas that correct, uh, to, that uh, calculate a uh, this number e, and so if we look at our design, and in our report now, we see that there is an error degree of freedom correction factor HFL, and it gives us a 0.73. You know, this is Heinfeld Lecatur. Um, and apparently there's incorrect ways to pronounce it. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly or not, but that's a correction factor that is related to this term. Okay. And I said, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get too bogged down in the math today. So I didn't put a lot of slides in here and I'm going to go down to where I actually have the one that I have in my report. So the Heinfeld Lecatur correction at 0.73 gives us a correction on our air degrees of freedom here in our rating date and our treatment by rating date interaction. So when we correct our degrees of freedom, we go from 252 degrees of freedom for a residual error to 183 degrees of freedom for a residual error. That's accounting for the fact that not all of those measurements are independent. Now notice we don't apply, I don't know if I have that in my slide, we don't apply a correction factor to the whole plot because the whole plot is still whole plot. That's still an RCB design. And we use the same error term, the treatment by, um, whole, or treatment by whole plot or treatment by replicate interaction um, because we don't, we don't have any, we still have that assumption that they're independently randomized. It's only when we start repeating me repeated measurements that we need to consider our error degrees of freedom. Um, I will point out too that we have another option called greenhouse geyser, which is typically considered more conservative. And so the default we use is the Heinfeld Lecatur. I forgot to include Lecatur on there. Um, there is something called the Heinfeld condition, which is a statement about sphericity. So, that's going to get me close to the main things I wanted to talk about today, that repeated measures are similar to split plot designs, except we do not assume that the repeated measures are independently randomized. And the lack of independent measurements induces a correlation structure. This reduces our estimate of error degrees of freedom, our experimental error, and we correct this by adjusting error degrees of freedom. Now, let me go real briefly and then we can open up for discussion as I think I've covered for this report the key components that we look for when we go from a split plot analysis to the repeated measures analysis. And that is a correction factor for error degrees of freedom and our 
uh, the reason we do our correction factor here in our correlations table, and then a nice graphic showing how our assessments change over time. Now, let's see which one did I want to use as an example. No, that's wheat yields. So I did the, an experiment years ago where I was working with mimosa plants. And if you've not used, ever seen mimosa plants, they're, they're a legume and they, um, they fold when you touch them. They're called the sensitive plant. And then after they've been folded, they reopen at a certain rate. Well, I, I was doing some just master's level stuff. So I was just playing around and I wanted to see if I could alter the rate at which they opened. Um, it was thought that oxen might play a part in the leaf opening and closing mechanism. So I treated some leaves with oxen, treated some leaves, didn't treat some leaves, or I treated them with just plain uh, lanolin. And I caused the leaves to fold. And then I measured the rate at which they opened. And so this is some data from that. I recorded an angle because I couldn't, uh, an angle between zero and four. Zero is the leaf was completely folded up. Four was the leaf was completely opened. And I use that as a measurement because it, this happens over about a 15 minute time interval. Now I fudged this in ARM by putting a rating date here, but we're actually looking at one minute intervals. So I've got this set up where I have um, my character rated and I'm looking at columns one through 17, uh, which is the whole time interval. And we're going to use the rating date as our descriptor. And what we see is the progression of the time series measurements. Now, one reason I wanted to use this as an example is because of the time scale that we're working with. This is a very short time scale for the type of process on a one minute interval. And we see that the correction factor is very large. Um, we looked at the numbers. Well, let's move it over here. and the correlations going down this main diagonal. So um, the last measurement correlated to the second to last measurement, almost 100, it was 100% correlated. The second to last measurement correlated with the third to last measurement was 80% correlated, 80% correlated, 50% correlated, 100% correlated. We have some really strong, really uh, high degree of correlation in these measurements since they are so highly correlated. And in fact, for most cases, I could have stopped measuring at about 10 minutes because by 10 minutes, most of the plants had stopped opening. So any measurement I made past here gives me relatively little information. Because there is so much correlation among these measurements, I get a degrees of freedom correction that's basically a third or a quarter of the total degrees of freedom I would have had had I not done the correction. So my significance here, my P of F is 0.12. Now let's take a look and see. And let's go ahead and take the correction off. I can't remember if this does what I think it does or not. And uh, let's go to the next one. and our P of F of interaction becomes significant. So if I, I want to say that, yes, these, these two treatments behaved differently over time, I would make an assertion that, yes, there is a difference in the time course of this response due to that treatment, because I have a significant um, P value. Okay. And that's what we're, we're looking at with repeated measures, is we're trying to, to look at uh, the, the time course of a response 
at the end, we might have the same thing. We might have the same thing at the beginning, but does it get there by a different path? That's really one of the things we're looking at with repeated measures is uh, not the end point, but the path to the end point. Again, and that uh, to remind us, you know, if we look at the treatment error at the whole plot effect, uh, we don't see any difference in the treatments regardless of our error correction because we're looking at the cumulative or total effect over time. Um, so our interpretations of these data is going to be the, the time course. And here I would say that there is a difference over time if I don't correct for error terms. Uh, we'll just go ahead and change the error term adjustment, but we'll use greenhouse geyser this time. And here, I don't think, I can argue that there is a significant interaction over time between these two, between the two treatments that the basic growth, the basic response curve is any really different. Okay, so we can close that one out. Um, uh, let's see, I want, I'm gonna briefly point out we have an example that I use for repeated measures in, um, in one of our tutorial files. I don't know if it's in our standard tutorial. And it's comparison to, um, oh no, this isn't the one I thought, sorry. I thought I had an AUDPC one, but this is a different one. I'm gonna go ahead and skip this one. This isn't the one I thought I was bringing up. So we're at about 15 minutes. So if anybody uh, has questions, or comments, we can start a discussion now. Um, let's see. I'm just going to try to double check. What's going on with my thing? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, are there any comments? Matt, are you still with me? Did I lose? I my am. Phone? Yes. Okay. Good. I thought I lost my sound. I was worried. All right. Ah. Well, if I don't have any questions off the top of my head, I did say. I would talk about how to fudge. So let's go to this prairie seeding trial. And I can use this to emphasize what I talked about earlier. And now I, I use red, green, and blue because they're things that I know. But there are some other measurements here. And one of the things I was interested in is two different things. There is what happens to the non-native species that are resident in this field um, that I want to kill off, things like um, brome grass, but there are also native, uh, native species that I want to encourage, um, things like big blue stem or a prairie coneflower. Um, some of the native plants that are in there that I want to re reestablish. And then there are also the non-native annuals that aren't going to be eliminated um, by my treatments that might take over from the perennials that I want to reestablish. And then there are the non-native to South Dakota, but native to somewhere else that I'm introducing in my seeding. So I counted in my plots Partridge pea was one that did really well. And if I go back to my picture, um, these plants, I believe, 
I don't know if those were the part. I think those might be the partridge peas, but I don't remember. They were nice and big and uh, took over, grew really well. So I kind of wanted to measure the difference in those um, in in those species. But then I have green foxtail and pigweed, which I don't want growing in there. Um, upright cone, the prairie coneflower, uh, these uh, different uh, coneflowers. These are in the mix, but they're also native. Um, there's bundle flowers that aren't native, milkweed that is something I want to come back to like spin any. Um, so what I wanted to do then is I wanted to look at a combined analysis of these, which means I am making a repeated measures assessment on the same day in the same whole plot, but not on the same assessment scale. The way we've structured repeated measures on the assumption that these things are being done over time is when I click on this in ARM, I don't get a good, uh, I don't get a selection. So what I actually have to do is I'm gonna to go to here. Oh, oh, sorry, there's a different button I wanna push. And it's this button over here. And I go from 31 to 41. And I'll get an analysis. Oh, there are no unique heteros. This is like, yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll just do that. I thought I saw it's like, why is this doing this? I'm just going to say no. So I can say that across the board, there are some treatments with these. And the two main ones are the spray and the Iowa mix and the spray and the Minnesota mix. And then the other ones are effectively the same. And I also can say that there are differences in counts. By the way, these are all counts of the number of plants. And so I can look at the different data columns and say there are more of one type of plant and less of the other. There were a lot of partridge bees in these plots across the board. They established themselves really well. Um, the second one was the green foxtail, and that's another one that establishes it well. And it also, there's going to be some interaction, which is kind of hard to interpret. We're going to skim that part for today. And notice, I don't have this nice rating date graph because I don't have rating dates. But what I can look at is the correlation structure and whether, say, for example, um, column 31, which was my partridge tree, is positively or negatively correlated with green foxtail. And so that would be 31 versus 32. And there tends to be a positive correlation where I see, the, say, the green foxtail and that um, introduced species. So I can look at kind of the um, important interactions with these. And I'm kind of lost track of which ones are which. 40 and 41 seem to be very highly correlated. Um, so let's go back. I should have printed this off with my header columns or my assessment column numbers. So it was 40 and 41. Okay, so side oats and I think that's panic grass is what I was calling it. So these, these two grass species were highly correlated in my uh, measurements. So anyway, that was why I briefly touched on uh, multivariate analysis and what the differences would be in uh, multivariate analysis that we would do. Um, that's, that's a fudging of a multivariate analysis as a repeated measures. So I think that takes up the rest of the time. Um, if there are any, any other questions? Um, any there isn't really any uh, specific mean comparisons. I asked a question in the chat. 
um, you still use the mean comparison test at the main effects levels. Um, because what we're doing, at least with this report, is we're just adjusting our degrees of freedom for air to account for um, to account for the correlation structure. If we were going to move towards more supporting with multivariate, um, we really don't, well, I guess I should back up. We can't, it, it's harder for us to do multiple range tests appropriately um, because the way range tests work, uh, we can't assume that the number of, uh, the distance between treatments is the same. So we tend to only support uh, pairwise comparison or LSD and HSD, where we look at specific contrasts as opposed to multiple range tests like uh, DMR, DMR or SNK. Um, and yeah, that, that complication to some extent falls out because these error structures don't translate nicely to the way the comparisons are made for multiple range tests. So yeah, we do have, I'm sorry, yeah, we, we do have limited, uh, we do limit some of the mean comparison tests when we use repeated measures. Um, but that's also some of the limitations. Um, yeah, yeah, let's just leave it at that. There's, we're gonna, we tend to limit some of the comparisons um, because of this uh, odd structure. Okay, and Matt is going to try to change me to host um, he, because I had set up so he could be host and let people in while I was talking. So if the service gets interrupted, we're going to blame Matt instead of me, right? <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh, which treatment did I decide in the best was the end? No. Okay. So let's go back to that. My experiment. Um, what I would lean toward if I were going to try to reestablish this as native grasses um, is honestly it's it's what's being recommended by the Department of Natural Resources and Game Fish and Parks people. Um, and I say that uh, trying to restore this type of habitat for uh, game birds is they prefer that you spray in the fall, spray in the spring, and then seed, because that leaves this stover for overwinter. And it leaves, um, it leaves, uh, well, it, it just leaves the residue um, and for bird nests in the spring. And in fact, one of the things I noticed when I did this is that where I had sprayed, I think meadow larks had set up a nest in, in, the, um, in, the, in the residual where I didn't burn it. Um, the other thing is this brome grass, burning it once doesn't do anything. And um, Mowing it doesn't do anything. If you're going to mow brown grass, you've got to mow repeatedly. And mowing repeatedly, this is an hour away. I didn't want to do that. Uh, I didn't think I was going to mow it, but I figured let's try it, uh, try it differently. Um, but I, I never really continued this experiment because this is actually agricultural land, and somebody in my family decided they needed to drive a tractor around in it one spring, and it kind of screwed up my plot. But for other things that I'm doing, yeah, bur spraying is is probably the best way to prepare a land like this to get ready to reestablish um, reestablish native plants. So it was, it was a successful experiment that way. And it turned out to be a handy data set. Um, there is one other thing in this data set, and I can't remember if it does anything interesting, but I found out that year in September, October, there was a lot of garden spiders. And I mean a lot of these big yellow garden spiders. They're uh, orb weaver spiders. And so I looked at counts of spiders. Oh, I want to clear that. And why isn't we're going the pest code? There we go. Let's see if that selects it. All right. Okay. And let's see. Uh, I need to. I'm just going to go this hard way. So I decided to count spiders because it was just kind of fun.
And I did find out that the garden web spiders tended to prefer where I had mowed. Burning, they didn't show, they didn't show very much in the burn plots and they did not nest, they did not create webs very much in the sprayed plot. But the mowing, they like the mow parts. Um, I guess this is kind of a useful one in that we don't have an error degrees of freedom correction. In fact, since it's larger than one, we can assume that these uh, data follow a, an independent or a homogeneity of variance. And the way I think of that is what I seeded and what I sprayed and what I mowed their plants, they don't travel around. There's, there's no way for them to move back and forth. But these spiders are kind of random. And so that any, any error that I had with spiders at the beginning, well, the spiders just up and move around. So I did find something kind of interesting there, I thought, in that the spiders tended to prefer where I had mowed. And they didn't show much preference um, other than that, although I do think they tended to like, well, yeah, I can't say really consistently that they, they preferred any of the seeding mixes either. But that was another side note. And I guess, yeah, I guess it's a good one to finish on because it does point out um, that sometimes when you do repeated measurements, you are going to get things that are effectively like a split plot design. Um, the other thing that I can point out is, uh, see, ya, somebody just said bye, that if you only have two or three assessments, well, you have two assessments, um, you're not going to get any degree, of, you're not going to get any correction because there's, there's just no correlation structure when you only have two. That, that diagonal is meaningless. So um, you're only going to get degrees of freedom correction if you probably have more than three or four repeated measures. Other than that, it's going to look a lot like a split plot design. And so if you do run a repeated measures analysis and you see this NA for the correction factor, it means that we don't violate the assumption of sphericity of our, our variances. And so the analysis is as if it had been done as a split plot. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, we'll have usual office hours tomorrow morning, uh, 9 o'clock, and I'll just talk about whatever pops into my head or whatever questions I get. So thank you very much.